How many AI models are sitting unused in your Olama installation right now? If you're like most users, you probably have no idea. And until recently, neither did I. That's why I built Omar, a tool to help manage your Olama models. But this video isn't just about a useful tool. It's about how I built it in Rust, a language I barely knew, in just a couple of hours using Windsurf, and then added a GUI in just 20 more minutes. If you're running Olama, chances are you've downloaded way more models than you actually use. Sure, we can delete models. I covered that in a somewhat recent video. But how do you know which ones to get rid of? Today, I'm solving that problem twice. First, by showing you this tool that I built, and then by walking you through how I created it using Windsurf. Before we dive deeper, make sure you're subscribed and hit that notification bell, especially if you're into AI tools and development. I've got some amazing Olama content coming up that you won't want to miss. Let me show you Omar, or Olama Model Report, in action. We'll look at two versions of the tool. First, the lightning fast CLI version that gives you a quick overview of your models, and then the GUI version that makes managing your models even easier. First, I'll run the first version of Omar, the CLI version, and see what we get. As you can see, it's super fast and almost immediately spits out some information. It's scanned through every model manifest and about 3 million lines of log files on my computer. At the top, I see there are a bunch of active models listed here. These are the models that are in Olama that are found in the logs as well. We can see a name, when the model was last used, how many times it was used, and its size. If there are multiple models with the same model weights file, they are listed on the same line. We can scan through this list to find the big models that haven't been used much, and it's been a while since we used them. This Tulu 3 seems like a good candidate to get rid of. Below active models is a section for unlogged models and deleted models, but we'll talk more about those in a little while. This app is nice, and it helps find models that are not being used much, but it's not exactly easy to select a model that you want to delete and then to delete it. I wanted to build a simple interactive UI. Now, I thought of doing this as a text-based UI, but decided to do it as a GUI because I have far less experience there, and tools like Windsurf can help me out. So I made this. It's not, still not pretty, but it's super fast, and provides a single list. I can sort models by name, or last used date, or usage count, or size, and can easily just click a button to delete that model from my system. It's still not perfect, but it's so damn useful. So how does Omar work? Well, it combines data from two sources, Olama's logs and its API. Now, while the API works consistently across platforms, the log file locations vary by operating system. On Mac, the logs are in .olama slash logs directory. On Windows, they can be found in local app data backslash olama. And on Linux, you get to them running journalctl-e-u olama. On Mac, they seem to be all the logs since you first installed the app. And since I was the third or fourth person on the planet to install Olama, it's been a while. On other platforms, I'm not exactly sure if that's the case, if it stores all the log lines or if it's uh, pruned down automatically. Now, I built Omar primarily for Mac, since that's my daily driver. But here's where it gets interesting. It's written in Rust, and I want to show you how you can contribute to making it better even if you've never written a line of Rust in your entire life. I think it supports Windows, but maybe you want to verify and, and fill out that Windows support. Using a tool like Windsurf makes any developer even better on languages you might not even know. Stick around, because I'm about to show you how the app collects its source information. Now, let's peek under the hood to see how this works. Every time you run a model in Olama, it leaves a trace in the logs. Let me show you exactly what we're looking for. I'll run the XL1 model. 
Now that's a great model from LG, by the way. And ask it something about black holes. Let's ask it to explain the concept of Hawking radiation. While it's thinking, I want you to notice something interesting about how Olama works behind the scenes. So let's check out the logs. See this line here? Every time you run a model, you'll see a similar entry showing a model with a specific SHA that's been loaded. Right before it, you'll notice a timestamp. Now this is crucial for tracking model usage. Initially, I tried using the Olama API to match those SHA values to model names. It required multiple calls and wasn't particularly efficient. Instead, I found a faster solution, just scanning through the manifest files directly to record model names. Now let's look at these manifests. They're essentially JSON files that contain all the model metadata. Now here's where we find the crucial mapping between those SHA values and the actual model names. By analyzing these logs systematically, we can track three key pieces of information. Which models have been loaded, how many times they've been loaded, and when they were last accessed. During development, I discovered several interesting edge cases that needed special handling. First, there were the ghost models. These are models that appear in the logs, but not in any manifest, typically because they were deleted at some point before now. Then there were the silent models. These appear in the manifests, but never show up in the logs, probably because of various custom builds or experimental features that I've run from time to time. This was particularly common during my time on the core maintainer team, where I often used custom builds that didn't write to the logs. Now, I still run custom builds every now and then to play with upcoming features. Remember that video I made recently on building from a PR? Well, that showed the exact process to get this to work. And third are multi-name models, cases where multiple model names share the same weights file using different parameters or system prompts. If you delete any one of them, you're not really gonna save the space because the other models are also using that same weights file. Unfortunately, I can't see the model name in the logs consistently, just the model weights file. Switching to the GUI meant the formatting could be simpler and more interactive. And here's where things get really interesting. Remember when I said I built this in Rust without knowing anything about Rust? Let me show you exactly how Windsurf made that possible. The magic starts with Windsurf's cascade chat window. Unlike other AI coding assistants, Windsurf doesn't just suggest code. It actively participates in the entire development process. Watch this. We can tell it what we want as we go. A simple command line app to show a list of all the models using the Olama tags endpoint. It thinks on that for a bit to figure out what it needs to do, summarizes the question, and starts to build out the files. It writes up the code, then comes up with the list of dependencies. It's able to run some things on its own, but this command needs a confirmation from us. And then it tries to run the new command, and it hits an error. It's able to see the error and figure out the problem. This, this is pretty easy. So it fixes it and runs it again. And that worked perfectly. Now it summarizes what it did, and it looks pretty good. So this is great, but I want the list sorted by size of the model. I intended to later ask it to make more readable numbers, but it figured out that would be important and automatically updated our simple application. And we can keep working with it. This is a super simple app, but I've worked with much more complicated applications as well. Now let's switch over to building Omar. I can't remember which log files it was working with, so I can just ask it. It looks through the code and lets me know how it works with those files. Again, I've looked at more complicated applications as well, and it does an amazing job of getting me up to speed on what that code does. While it's possible to work with the ID in this way, giving a bit more and building the app one sentence at a time, I think that everyone will be a whole lot happier if you think about what you want first and then work with that. So in the case of Omar, I've figured out what information needs to be collected and then how to use it. 
I then documented everything in a single document. It's the same thing Mark Levy writes about in Accidental Genius, a book about using writing to help you generate your best ideas. You can write when you need to sort through your thoughts on any given topic. If you write it down to formulate the ideas, you can get the arguments straight in your head. Cool book, and it totally applies here. Before doing this, I found myself wasting cycles having the AI going in opposing directions, adding features that conflicted with my overall goals for the app. Now, you might be thinking, wait, doesn't Cursor do this too? Well, yes and no. While Cursor has added similar features, there's a fundamental difference in how Windsurf approaches development versus how Cursor does it. To me, it feels like Cursor is just a plugin that's been bolted onto VS Code. Feels a bit like a kludge. Cursor had to then catch up to Windsurf when it came out, and they added some features that have a different feel from what they had before. Like they were bolted onto the piece already bolted onto VS Code. Getting this stuff right is, is hard. I remember at Datadog, when we acquired, I think it was called Logmatic, we kept the acquisition secret for a year until we could blend it in to the rest of the product and make it feel like it belonged. Cursor feels like the new functionality was just slapped on without really taking the care needed. Windsurf, on the other hand, in my opinion, feels more deliberately designed. It's not just bolted onto VS Code, it's a seamless component that makes coding feel like having a conversation with an incredibly capable assistant. I guess that comes as part of the organization behind Windsurf which has been building AI tools together as a team for years, while Cursor is a newer addition to the market. It's a similar story to Olama. Olama wasn't the first product we built as a team. There was Infra first, and then an SSH key management tool before pivoting to Olama. I don't know if Olama would have been quite as successful if we didn't learn to be a team with those other solutions. Now, none of these tools will let a non-developer build a complicated application on day one. They all still need someone familiar with how application code logically works. You still need to be able to work through potentially complicated errors, even if the assistant will help you solve them. These tools are amazing at giving an experienced developer a helping hand as they work the code, doing some things for them as needed, but getting out of the way when that's needed too. Now, as you can probably tell, I am really digging Windsurf right now. And it may not be obvious that they're not sponsoring this video. But Windsurf is not perfect yet. Their Wave 2 release a few weeks ago was definitely a step backwards. Running commands in the terminal automatically completely broke if you've upgraded from the default shell to something more modern, like fish. So you have to downgrade back to ZSH to get that to work. When working with AI coding assistants, it's crucial to follow good development practices. Use version control religiously, add features incrementally, commit changes frequently, and review AI generated code carefully before accepting it. This approach helps prevent the common pitfall of having your code base break due to AI generated changes and makes it easier to roll back if needed. And as soon as you recognize that the AI is going down a path it just can't recover from, take advantage of this and roll back to before things went wrong. Most of these tools have a rules file like Windsurf rules or cursor rules. Use that to define your build stack and how you want to work. Windsurf also has memories which will record important aspects of what the AI has done so that you don't need to rediscover stuff later on. It's great in theory, but half the time it says it creates them, it doesn't, even when you specifically ask it to do so. I look forward to this feature getting nailed down in the future. Many of these tools can also look up docs for you, at least in theory. If those docs use JavaScript on the page, you may not get anything. I kept giving it the docs and tried to get it to save them as a memory, but it would forget. Go back to a previous version of the API and try to break everything every few prompts. 
Even with all the frustration that comes with these tools, they can still make a great dev 20 to 40% better. They can also make me 20 to 40% better. I think that's pretty cool. Whether you came here for the Olama tool or you're interested in trying Windsurf, I hope this video showed you something valuable. Drop a comment below if you'd like to see more content about either topic. And don't forget to check out the links in the description for everything we covered today. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.